All right. Great. It's a great case, Harish. Sorry, I didn't expect this much discussion for <laughs> this case, but <laughs> but I can, yeah, you can. So, you know, I mean, this is, uh, so the next case, it's a, a male in the 60s. It, we see this all the time. It comes with headaches, nausea, vomiting, gait instability. You know, we you have these sort of symptoms. You would put this, you know, somewhere in the posterior fascia area, cerebellum, brainstem area, and your exam, he has some bilateral dysmetria. Uh, is you would get an MRI, and and this is what what the MRI looks like. Um, you have you have sort of an enhancing nodule here with a big cyst, and and you know, almost compressing the compressing the frame and magnum here, um, and with some sort of significant brainstem compression as well. Maybe some amount of uh, you know uh, sort of ventricular megaly, um, and 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 in this this is this T two again a nodule with a with a cyst. Uh, sort of CSF density cyst. Uh, in this case, you know, this midline suboccipital approach is, is a great approach. Uh, this is just a post-op uh, sort of CT scan showing, and you, know, you just need a small amount of, of midline, uh, small midline uh, sort of craniotomy uh, to approach this, this sort of uh, cyst here. And this is just a sort of a small, I'll, I'll rush this quickly, and this is uh, just to orient uh, everybody. This is the cranial side, caudal side, right side, left side, and this is uh, the, the dura is being opened here, um, and and you know once you open the dura, and then after that cisterna magna, you will see the cerebellum, and obviously, and then and then once you transgress the cerebellum, uh, you make a corticotomy in the cerebellum, uh, you will see uh, sort of the cyst walls, and the cyst starts to line up, and and you dissect the cyst separate from the cerebellar tissue, and and you you once the cyst is uh, opened up, you start seeing. Uh, the nodule here with its intimate relationship with the branches of the pica. Uh, you dissect the branches of the pica, separate the nodule out, and once the nodule comes out, uh, what you see is uh, sort of, you know, this is some dissection uh, separating the blood. Once you get the nodule out, what you see is this beautiful anatomy of this uh, fourth ventricle. Uh, again, this is the midline sulcus of the fourth ventricle here, and that's a cerebral aqueduct looking up here and you would be in the third ventricle somewhere up. Uh, beneath this cartonoid is the cervical medullary junction, the medulla trans transitioning into the uh, spinal cord here. Uh, and these, uh, you know, these are either sides of the pons over here with the superior medullary velum here and inferior medullary velum uh, from this, with, from this, uh, the tumor was arising here. Uh, and, and this is uh, sort of, a, you know, what you can, again, a midline suboccipital, uh, simple craniotomy. Uh, you can get the tumor, the cyst out, uh, you can see that uh, you know the the brainstem compression is is relieved, uh, and this turned out to be a coad plexus papilloma. Uh, not uncommon to have a fourth ventricular uh, sort of a, a coad plexus papilloma in this age group. Um, next is you know a, a sort of a younger age, thirty nine year old male. He's a computer engineer. You know, uh, and and comes with headaches and nauseas. Um, and he's neurologically intact and not much to sort of, you know, uh, on, on any exam, uh, gets a scan and, and here's what we see, uh, you know, sort of an enhancement, but some areas of non-enhancing area, but looks like it is not in the cerebellum, but in the fourth ventricle, uh, sort of filling the lower, uh, you know, the, the lower half of the fourth ventricle and sort of some, uh, a mass coming out, what looks like is from the frame, frame of Mujandi. Uh, in the midline, uh, sort of where the CSF exits out uh, in the fourth ventricle, and uh, and again for this, uh, this is a midline suboccipital craniotomy, but a slightly different approach, uh, where where you would where you would not only do this craniotomy and, and maybe a C1 laminectomy as well, but this year instead of straight looking down into the uh, cerebellum, you're now sort of lifting the cerebellum up and looking underneath the cerebellum, the vermis and the and the uvula over here, and and this is sort of the rotten, uh, you know, uh, anatomy uh, pictures here. Some beautiful dissection. This is the way your these are your tonsils here. The uvula is here, um, and and you know the cerebellum, the tonsil is retracted over here on either sides. This is your foramen of Majandi, and in it would be the fourth ventricle you would inside. And once you open this tela here, tela choroidea through which the choroid plexus is attached. This is the inferior medullary velum. That's why that's where it gets the name tela, telovelar approach. When you open this up, you see this beautiful fourth ventricle 
and the cerebral aqueduct, again, connecting the fourth to the third ventricle, pons here, medulla here, and obviously down here, it's a cervical medullary junction. And, and, and this particular tumor that I just showed in the fourth ventricle, we approach this uh, sort of similar to this. And, and as you can see, you can, you can reach all the way up and get out, get the tumor out. This is some core plexus enhancement over here. And again, and the fourth ventricle is free of the tumor and, you know, and, and they do quite well. And this here, this was a, a ependymoma, uh, a grade two tumor. He did quite well. Uh, and, and this is sort of a gross total resection here. Um, and here's a, you know, uh, sort of, these are all, uh, this ependymoma is this one uh, here, uh, the earlier one that I showed you, we don't have to transgress any brain tissue, but sometimes these ependymomas can be within, uh, within inside the brain tissue. So here's a 24-year-old. In this case, I did in Australia with uh, Charlie Teo. Uh, it's a 24-year-old male with weakness, gait imbalance, and paresthesia. He's a college student. You know, he's got uh, some hyper, he's hyperreflexic, he's some weak hands, uh, some patchy loss of sensation, and and he has uh, this MRI scan looking, you know, an extensive sort of an enhancing, heterogeneously enhancing lesion. It looks uh, sort of, uh, you know, intramedullary, uh, uh, you know, in, uh, intraaxial sort of, sort of a tumor all the way from the cranial vertebral junction, brainstem over here, down to sort of the thoracic area. And in this case, uh, you know, this is, I think there's a small video here. And this is an intraaxial, as I said, you need to transgress the uh, sort of the sp spinal cord cranial uh, and, and all the way up uh, to orient cranial here, caudal here, that's the left side, the right side, so cranial is here. And this is, uh, the dura has been opened here with the dual edges tacked up on either side. This is the expanded cord, the one would you know, appreciate this is really expanded. The tumor fills the whole, the, the sort of, you know, the, the inside of the spinal canal, spinal cord, and, and a midline myelotomy has been made here. And you can see, yeah. and and uh, as you, you start to clearly see the tumor, sort of which looks separate from, from the rest of the spinal cord here. I'm gonna go ahead and see. And these tumors generally tend to have a very good plane, but when they get bigger, they do have some points of attachment where they get their blood supply. But generally, uh, overall, they tend to have a very good, very good uh, sort of plane here. This normal spinal cord, the tumor is here. It's a it's nice plane uh, that, that separates this. And, and I'm going to speed it up. And yeah, so this, you know, this rolls over this tumor. Uh, generally, if it's a smaller one, it comes out in one piece, but a bigger one, because of their attachments, they, they tend to have, you tend to debulk and truncate uh, to, to make it safer. Um, and, and once the tumor is out, you know, here you see, this is the, what is left of the spinal cord here. And of course, the myelotomy is one edge, the other edge is here, the dura is still there. And this is the cavity left within the spinal cord uh, by the tumor. Um, as you can see, this is the, the, the spinal cord, you know, being sort of detethered de in some sense from the, from the, um, the, the dura here. And uh, you, you stitch up there the dura and, and uh, you know, you get, you get the scan. And they, these, again, this is an ependymoma, uh, has nice planes, tends to come out very well. Uh, this uh, young, young guy, so about, I think three, four months out, uh, he had, you know, he had completely recovered from all his uh, weakness and, uh, and his paresthesias. He had some patchy sensation left in his, I think, upper thigh area, uh, but otherwise he'd done, done remarkably well, his back, back and, you know, in his college. Arish, that's, that's an awesome case. Would you mind if I interrupt and just ask you a sure, couple sure. of questions about that? So I'm curious, what, what is your methodology for performing your midline myelotomy to try to uh, mitigate the risk of having proprioceptive dysfunction after surgery? Is there anything in particular you do outside of maybe dorsal column mapping before you make that midline myelotomy? You know, they, they always get, they always get, uh, you know, um, uh, sort of the, the sort of subtle, this dysmetria, this kind of things. They always get midline anatomy, allodynia, which is very common. Uh, so, you know, just stay in the midline if you can find the sulcus, which is, you know, which you can say in a normal anatomy, but, but in an abnormal anatomy like this, where the tumor uh, spans, it's hard to find the, the midline sulcus most of the time because the cord has expanded so much. But so just relatively just stay in the midline and, and I use 11 blade, uh, you know, just uh, and, and stay in the midline, but they almost always get uh, uh, these dorsal column symptoms. 
what they tend to do very well, uh, you know, after a few weeks, uh, they tend to recover very well. Um, even the allodynia gets better, but but there are some patients to whom, with whom they, they tend to just linger on these symptoms. Sure. Second question I have, I got three questions about this case. Second question is, is do you, um, are you an advocate for closing the PIA afterwards to help prevent spinal cord tethering or do you leave it open? I typically leave it open on my case and I can't say I've had cases come back of spinal cord tethering, but I've only been in practice for three years. So if, maybe I'm yeah. wrong. If it is long, if it is a long midline myelotomy, I do put a couple of stitches. Uh, um, you know, I don't think there is any literature supporting either way, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I do put a couple of stitches just to keep it together, uh, uh, just, just so that, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't, uh, you don't have it tethering. Uh, sure. Yeah. And, and for some of our orthopedic colleagues, like, like uh, Dr. Mamagani here, I'm sure he's wondering, we do such an extensive resection of the poster elements here, right? We're taking C1, C2, all the way down to the upper thoracic spine. Um, you know, what are you guys doing preoperatively? Are you getting upright x-rays on them to see what their overall alignment is like? Are you doing a laminoplasty in these patients? How, how are you kind of mitigating the risk of, of having um, post-laminectomy kyphosis and such an extensive resection of the poster elements? Is that, is it, to, is it to me or I thought? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm just curious in, okay. in this case, yeah. Harish, if, if there was anything you did because it looks like you guys took about six or yeah, seven took the, final yeah. segments. Yeah, we, we we took the whole whole sort of the the the, the lamina out. We did not do a, a laminoplasty uh, in this case. Uh, you know, he had sort of sort of a fairly good low doses. So the, and he was young, so the decision was made that you know he would just uh, do, and uh, um, and he seemed to have done fine uh, yeah. till now. Yeah, but awesome. I'm but I'm sure but I'm sure you know uh, there are some cases where where this could be a problem. Certainly, if it is a straight spine or. Um, obviously, if it's a kyphotic spine, that would be a different thing. But if it's if it's a good low doses, uh, you know, I I think that would be okay. But but uh, I almost always ask some spine colleagues <laughs> whether what, right. what their preference would be here. Alex, what do you what do you think? Um, if you I were think, to, I think I level. think you 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 guys from neurosurgery are doing awesome awesome surgeries. Uh, Harish, impressive impressive video. Um, really, I appreciate listening to you. Um, I think. Um, I wonder how many hours uh, does this kind of surgery take? Um, are you in there for four hours or is this more than four hours? Um, and um, as an orthopedic surgeon, I'm, uh, I'm a fan of staged surgeries. If I would get the invitation for this surgery, I would say, okay, maybe first you do the uh, tumor resection and have a look at uh, what happens in the, uh, in the post-operative uh, course. Um, how, how many hours did that this, this usually this, take? Yeah, this was about seven hours of surgery, if I, if I remember. Yeah, oh, so uh, not uncommon to have these uh, sort of cranial vertebral junction if you have a tumor, intradural tumor, to have this long, uh, this surgeries. Uh, you know, uh, one could think about staging, but, but uh, you know, um, I, I think uh, staging is appropriate when, when your approach is, is a long, sort of a you know, time-consuming approach, and then you have a long time-consuming um, uh, cross-section, tumor section approach, then I would uh, sort of think about staging. Uh, but in this case, in the approach is not, not that long. Uh, it's the, it's the, the actual tumor, the, the surgery, the tumor section, per se, introduced or uh, you know, tumor section that takes longer. Uh, in that case, you know, I, I don't think I get a lot out of staging it from a time perspective. Thank you. Okay. So, you know, here, uh, so we talked about uh, midline approaches to the intradural pathologies, uh, but, you know, not all pathologies ca uh, can, uh, you know, will be midline. Uh, there'll be some, you know, now we'll venture out the lateral spot. How do you, how do you tackle that? Now that's where we start to think about some, you know, what, what sort of a posterior lateral or posterior lateral approaches. And, and in, in them, there are uh, sort of broadly categorized in two formats. It's a postlateral retrosigmoid approach. So, so uh, you know, by definition, these are behind the sigmoid sinus. Um, you're posterior to the sigmoid sinus. And this is uh, now here, represented here. Uh, so midline is somewhere here. And, and your, your, you know, your angle of attack is in this postlateral area. 
uh, sigmoid sinus would be somewhere here, transverse sinus here, sigmoid sinus here. So by definition, you are staying behind the sigmoid sinus in this area. And, and you know, this is again a rotten dissection here. You know, once you, once you sort of dissect the muscles uh, out, you know, you, you will get uh, the C1, the atlas, the transverse process of the atlas, which can be palpated, uh, you know, uh, sort of from the skin. And this is the C2. And, and obviously, uh, you, it, you are going to be right in the line of the vertebral artery when you, when, when you take this approach. Uh, you know, the C1, the sulcus arteriosus, the vertebral artery is on it. Um, and, and you will be, so you have to be careful about this. So uh, as I said, um, the midline approach generally tends to have you know, a lot less of neurovascular structure till you reach the dura, but in here, uh, you know, vertebral artery is a, is a formidable force that you have to be careful about. And once you take the arch structures, you open the dura, uh, you, know, you, you, you will see this, sort of this, uh, this view, where here the, the vertebral artery is transected, here's the atlanto-occipital joint here, and, and you and intradurally you will start seeing these these are the cervical you know nerve roots uh, the, the lower cranial nerve roots 9 10 this is 11 cranial nerve uh, with its cervical uh, rootlets coming all the way up and then entering into the uh, jugular foramen area the 12th nerve root vertebral artery uh, the posterior inferior cerebellar artery uh, you know the branches here and this is the contralateral side so so you know this area is, is, is sort of very low, you know, sort of risk tolerance over here. Any error, again, can be very devastating. But, you know, we don't like to transgress uh, or, or work around the cranial nerve roots, but sometimes uh, it is what we have, and, and we may end up with a pathology that, that needs that, that sort of an approach. Um, and this is, this is sort of one, uh, one 60-year-old female with, you know, diplopia, gait imbalance, and, and weakness. Um, and, and you have this you know, enhancing interdural lesion. It looks like you know, some sort of involvement with the vertebral artery here. And, and this is the sort of uh, you know, the medulla cranial uh, cervical medullary junction over here, sort of quite, quite compressed, quite pushed back uh, dorsally uh, with, this, with this sort of mass. Uh, you know, this looks like a meningioma. And, and you can see this is you know, right at the foramen magnum. And this is an ideal case for a uh, for a far lateral, posterolateral, a sort of a retrosigmoid approach, uh, and which is what we we did for for this this particular tumor. And here, you now it's a short sort of a sort of a video here, uh, just to orient. This is cranial cephalad here. This is caudal. This is anterior here. Uh, so so this is the right side of the patient. This would be the left side of the patient here. And and here, uh, I'm just gonna. You, you, this is you know working through you you have you have the door opening over here it is tacked up uh, and and behind this cotinoid is a cerebellum uh, and and the uh, and sort of the medulla would be here and and here you can see there is some tumor here that is being dissected between the nerve the rootlets of the nine ten cranial nerves this is cranial nerve eleven uh, you have this window from which some tumor was taken out. And this is vertebral artery. There is, you see the structure here. This is vertebral artery here, uh, 11th cranial nerve, uh, 9, 10 cranial nerves, you know, going into the jugular foramen here. So, so in this, these cases, you, you don't have a single window. You make the windows between these nerve rootlets and, and neurovascular bundle. Uh, you try to you know, find the, the, the window that, that you can work and you take these uh, tumors out in piecemeal. Sometimes your microscopy may not be enough here. Uh, as you will see, and, and because the tumors can be behind this and there is no way to see this, in which case you may have to introduce, uh, in, which I uh, almost always do is introduce an endoscope in this area. Uh, so here, you know, micro, it is under the microscope, and you're trying to uh, remove some tumor out, you know, whatever you can with this. Again, the cranial nerve roots, vertebral artery here, and, and it's not, okay, there is some, some tumors there, but once you cannot, you introduce the endoscope here. This is the vertebral artery here. This here, there is an 11th cranial nerve here. And this is, you know, the endoscope is introduced, which is, could not be seen by the microscope. Now there is some tumor hiding behind uh, underneath those neurovascular bundle. Here you can see some of the perforators uh, from, the, from this uh, the vertebral artery. Um, and, and you see, you try to remove some with the endoscope. Uh, you go this back and forth uh, 
between the endoscope and the microscope. You come back to the microscope, and now some, 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 you took out some tumor out, so some, something becomes a little more, a little more flexible, and you get, go back to your, uh, you know, those, those crevices between the, between the nerve roots. Um, and, uh, and this is patient work. You just, uh, and uh, to your question, Alex, this, this took, I think, 11 hours, this surgery. Uh, but uh, finally, you know, uh, so this is the end, uh, sort of what the craniotomy will look like. Uh, you, you would take the lateral part of the occipital bone behind the sigmoid sinus. And this sometimes also needs, as in this case, a part of the condyle was resected to, to give, to approach the ventral part of the brainstem, so to say. In you know, the contralateral side, you can see this particular bone would, would hinder your view and approach uh, getting to the ventral side of the, uh, the, the brainstem. Uh, you resect uh, part of the condyle. Uh, you know, how much condyle can come out, I don't think anybody really knows, but, but makes sort of sense more than half would be a problem. Um, so, uh, you know, here sort of almost half the condyle was resected um, and to approach this tumor. And, and this is the pre op scan here, this is the post op scan. And, and you know, sometimes, uh, as I say, you get lucky and you get this uh, sort of this result. And, and a year out, this patient is, you know, has no weakness, is driving. Uh, you know, you're happy, the patient is happy, uh, and, and things sometimes work out. Harish, that's, that's not luck. That's, uh, that's exquisite surgical skill right there. Um, question I have <laughs> for you, how, yes. how do you orient yourself to how much condyle you're resecting? You know, uh, so this is the only reason to get a navigation in this case. So I did this under navigation only for resecting the condyle. Uh, and... Uh, and so I constantly would, uh, you know, uh, if you have in a, a normal anatomy, you could see, you know, if you can see the jugular foramen and you can see the hy hypoglossal uh, foramen, if you can, you can sort of judge what you get. But in these cases, you cannot because it's all behind you uh, and you're, you're resecting the condyle when you're extra door. So uh, this navigation makes it, a, uh, you know, a lot easier and to judge that. And what are you using as far as uh, vertebral artery protection? Do you bring a Doppler in during these cases or, or do you just, yes. you do? So, okay. Yeah, in these cases, you know, you have a Doppler and I also have some aneurysm clips ready um, uh, just in case if, uh, if, if this turns out from a tumor to a vascular case. Uh, so, so uh, you know, you go prepare for the worst in some sense. So it is prepared like a vascular case. You have your Dopplers, you have your aneurysm clips uh, um, and just in case if, if you know, if that's, if, if you end up with some, that kind of a scenario. So, you know, this is uh, sort of a little higher up, uh, sort of somewhere in the mid clival area, but this is a tumor. Again, uh, in 72 year old female, gait imbalance, a typical same kind of similar symptoms, but in this case, it's decreased hearing on the right side. You know, no, no wonder this is this large tumor sitting in the internal level trimier, is probably a vestibular schwannoma. And, and this was again attacked uh, through the retrosigmoid area uh, because uh, you know it's a large tumor coming all the way down to the frame and magnum area. Uh, you know, this could also be attacked, which is very commonly done, is through the lateral approach, which I will show in a little bit. Uh, through this uh, sort of you know the lateral approach is in front of sigmoid sinus behind the external ear canal, so to say. This is a common approach uh, to tackle these tumors. Uh, from the lateral. So that would be a pre-sigmoid approach. But this was approached uh, through, uh, through the retrosigmoid, uh, so behind the sigmoid, far lateral uh, kind of an approach here. Um, and uh, and you know, there's, these tumors have some, uh, always they are intimately involved with the, with the cranial nerves, the schwannomas. Uh, so this was in the 9, 10, and the 7 was uh, you know, it, it very adherent to this. So we left some tumor there. Uh, but quite a decent result, uh, you know, and, and the patient did, did fine, had no cranial nerve uh, uh, palsies in this case. Um, so, we, you know, sort of just a quick the lateral pre sigmoid approach, uh, you know, as this is this is lateral and this is pre sigmoid, so you're in front of the sigmoid, and this is basically you're in the temporal bone, uh, and, uh, and, and depending upon how, how, how you, would, you, would, you would, your goal is, your approach is. Uh, you know, you, you, the, the ossicles and the middle ear uh, may or may not be sacrificed. As again, I wrote on uh, sort of cadaver dissection, uh, nose is here, 
uh, top of the head, neck here, uh, you know, the uh, so, sort of the, uh, the mastoid tip is here. And, and you have an inc incision here and roughly your, your sigmoid sinus would be somewhere here. So if these, these approaches are meant to be in front of the sigmoid, behind the external ear, and essentially the mastoid mode uh, is, the, is the angle of attack here. And, and when you open up the skin, subcutaneous tissue, uh, this, the mastoid is drilled out, the mastoid antrum is opened up. This, uh, these are the semicircular canals. Uh, your, your working angle is between the sigmoid sinus. Uh, in this, if you have this view between the sigmoid sinus and behind this when, uh, sort of labyrinth, the semicircular canals, uh, here's a small window uh, where you can get to the sort of the midclival, internal auditory meatus, midclival, that area. Uh, and, and depending upon if they don't have any hearing or the hearing is lost, hearing is uh, not serviceable anymore, uh, you can take the semicircular canals out to make a bigger window. Uh, you get a, a wider exposure. Uh, you can take out the co cochlea, uh, you get a much wider exposure. Again, depends upon what your goal is, what you're trying to accomplish and what the pathology is. But this is, again, uh, a, a common route to get to, get to that area ventral uh, to the, the brainstem. Uh, ventral to uh, the spine, uh, uh, sort of, you know, sort of the whole cervical medullary junction. So as I said, this is the same case before, as I said, this, 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 these are ideal for, you know, these kind of cases. Uh, you can go through this area, you, you drill out all this bone and, and you see the tumor in, in front of you. Uh, and, and these have one advantage, they don't have any cerebral attraction. Uh, you're straight seeing the tumor, but with the disadvantage that that uh, you know, these are generally uh, non. They are hearing non-preserving preserving surgeries. The hearing is gone uh, unless um, you know you, they specifically you try to preserve them by keeping the middle ear uh, compartments. So you know this is this is a case uh, uh, sort of another a 29 year old female uh, history of some vascular pathology, cavernous malformation, multiple. Uh, he's got you know she's got a new sort of a pons lesion with hemorrhage. Um, she has baseline dysmetria from, from her multiple other cavernous malformations before and some weakness. And, and uh, you know, and yeah, this is, uh, this is from, my, from my friend and colleagues uh, sort of at the, at the House Institute of Zach Barnett and Greg Lekovic. Uh, this is what, what the MRI looks like. This is the lesion here. And I think this is a video, yeah, lesion here. And, and as, as I mentioned, this is behind the ear, your incisions incision is some you know, here and you're trying this is your sort of roughly the angle of attack here you'll see the uh, yeah just sort of back a little bit to orient uh, mastoid tip is here external ear is here the top of the head is here your sigmoid sinus would be somewhere here now here oops sorry uh, the, the mastoid is being drilled out uh, you know and soon uh, you'd start to see the mastoid air cells, the antrum, uh, you clean up their antrum, all the air cells, and, and pass. these are the semicircular canals. In this particular case, this, you know, this, was, this was maintained, which is the semicircular canals were not transgressed, but you have the sigmoid sinus uh, here, and, and you, this is your sort of the window where, where you would, you would go through to reach that pathology. Uh, and you open up the dura here, and, and you are in the cervical, uh, sort of cerebral opontine angle, so to say. And this is you know, intraoperative uh, navigation showing the, the exact spot, picking up the spot, and, and you open up, you make a small part of me. Generally, they, they do have some discoloration on top of it, and that's the you know, classic looking uh, sort of cavernous malformation. And, mulberry appearance that's generally I mean, uh, some dissection, micro dissection under the microscope, and they should come out in one piece. Um, generally, they have a hemorrhage around them. You can clean up the hemorrhage uh, and get a nice sort of resection of this, the, the malformation. And so, so this is the approach that, that is through you know, the lateral, pre sigmoid lateral approach. Again, it's slightly higher up in the, in the sort of mid clival area, but you could, you could reach the lower clivus as well uh, if, if the pathology suggests so.
moving on, this is uh, it's another sort of a, a, a 40 you know, he's male in his 40s. Uh, he presented with face paresthesias, uh, you know, he's worked up for stroke. And uh, what we find is this, this big mass, uh, you know, in the, in the cranial vertebral junction all the way down uh, to what was uh, at the bifurcation of the, of the you know, the, the common carotid. Uh, this uh, is most likely a carotid body tumor of paraganglioma. Um, and, uh, you know, this is uh, sort of classically it's a surgical case, but given that he was, you know, his BMI was 59 or something, and he had congestive heart failure, uh, we chose not to operate on this uh, and, uh, you know, sort of working for some, for radiation. But uh, this is, again, a, a pathology that you would see at the CV junction, uh, sort of, you know, with more ventral uh, in front of the C1. And they are, they are attacked from a lateral perspective, um, you know, subtemporally, so to say, uh, underneath the mastoid. And obviously, this one was going into the, the jugular foramen area. Um, and, and if need be, you may have to do a mastoidectomy as well uh, to sort of get to that area. But it, it, this was a simple radiation for the, uh, for the reasons. Harish, is, is there any concern that these particular types of tumors um, may be functional and that if you get into it, you could, you could have like a catecholamine surge during the operation? Is there anything that you do to, to, to kind of mitigate the risk of that happening? Yeah. You know, generally this, uh, uh, the paragang uh, sort of carotid, carotid body tumors uh, do not have, but yes, you have to be careful. You have to work them up for, uh, for you know, seeing if there's a catecholamine surge, you, you know, you, you have a very close communication with your uh, anesthesia colleagues, uh, make sure, you know, they are ready uh, with, you know, for that surge if they have, but they, it's the adrenal uh, sort of body tumors that generally tend to have uh, sort of catecholamine surge, but carotid body tumor, you have to be aware of it, but generally they are not, but they are very vascular, very profusely they bleed, so you have to be aware of those uh, as well. Moving on, we'll uh, sort of next, you know, sort of uh, anterior approach. Um, I mean, so, as I showed this earlier, multiple ways to get to the cranial cervical junction uh, from anterior perspective, as these are, you know, of only of historical importance. We don't do them anymore. Uh, but, you know, going through the nose, through the mouth, maxilla, uh, you know, the oral cavity, uh, and even, you know, uh, splitting the mandible to get to the get to the cranial cervical junction uh, is, is, is a known um, uh, sort of a route to get it. And, and you know, this is uh, sort of what uh, sort of cadaver anatomy looks like. You know, you, uh, this is your cranial cervical junction, the clivus here, foramen magnum, C1, uh, the dense here. And, and, you know, when you get to this, what, what the, the, the challenge here is that you have all these organs over here that are in front of you. Uh, to get to this, and and you have to somehow somehow either move them, split them, you know, reflect them. The, the purpose being being you can get some light so you can see it. Uh, you know, you can put an instrument, you will get there, but you have to get the light to see it. And that's where that's why this these sort of extensive ENT approaches were devised to get the light uh, to this uh, sort of clival area, the cranial cervical junction area. But in the modern world, you know, endoscopy has sort of replaced a lot of those, those uh, sort of very morbid ENT uh, sort of procedures uh, because you can get the now, not the light outside, but you can get the light inside with an endoscope and, and you don't need to sort of, you know, uh, sort of remove, resect or, 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 you know, manipulate these structures. You can go straight to the, with the endoscope to the light. And, and obviously with the endoscope, you can angle wherever you want to the nose can go all the way up from the anterior you know, skull base all the way down uh, if appropriate for an anatomy through the nose um, to the cranial cervical junction or you, can, you may need to go to the, to the transoral route to get to the cranial cervical junction uh, with an endoscope. And, and, uh, and you know this is what uh, sort of a microscopy open sort of looks like you know this is transoral route here um, hard palate soft palate you know in, in, in a trans oral case, you would you would take you would have the uvula reflected into the na nasal pharynx, but here it has you know it has been dissected and like a trapdoor thing it has been reflected to one side, and and when you reflect when you remove sort of the uvula here, you you're in the front of the clivus here, the clivus, and you open this uh, sort of mucosa here, uh, you 
you're in, you know, you see the clivus and, and you start seeing the, the, the cranial cervical junction, the C1 and C2, you reflect the muscles, you see the anterior arch of C1 and, and, and the C2. So transoral route, you know, transnasal route will also give you a uh, sort of good access to, to the clivus and including the lower clivus, but, but sometimes your hard palate may come in your way uh, when, when you're working in the lower clivus area, the transoral route uh, sort of gives you a very direct access to the cranial cervical junction. And, and this is an endoscopic view of, of the same. You can see, you know, it's all the way from the pituitary gland all the way up here, uh, you know, the optic chiasm of pituitary gland, pons here, basilar artery here. Uh, this is foramen magnum, C1 and C2. So through the nose, through the mouth, how you, you want it, depending upon your pathology, depending upon your approach, uh, you can get a panoramic view of the whole uh, sort of, you know, the, the clival, paraclival uh, sort of area. Um, and, and this is a close up view of, of the, this is foramen magnum uh, left over here and, and C1 and C2 junction. You can see the, the anterior spinal arteries uh, and the vertebral arteries. So, this is, you know, uh, so as I said, a lot of the sort of those morbid uh, ENT approaches have been replaced by, by, by the endoscopic route, or which, which uh, you know, uh, which have made it less morbid. Uh, nonetheless, they are morbid, but less morbid compared to those. Uh, huge, big incision, facial incisions. Um, and this is sort of, you know, what, what has happened. This is, you can see, this is, I think this is how we could, uh, sort of picture of how we could trying to do it, you know, working to get the sort of a transoral, transnasal, uh, to sort of a transphenoidal route. The whole purpose of this, you know, is, is making this big incision. It's trying to get the light to here so, so you can see it uh, with this headlamp, uh, you know. Uh, and, and this is another picture from, I think, in the, in the early 1900s or late, 1800, uh, you know, a transphenoidal where there is no light, but they are using sort of a measuring tape or measuring as a, as a dipstick, uh, trying to see how far they have reached because they can get light to it. Um, so, but that, you know, that has been replaced, as I said, again, with the endoscope, where this is the, uh, from, from a cranial perspective, it's a microscope. You, if you make a you know, small craniotomy, you can get only this to see these structures, but if you can push the endoscope in, you get a panoramic view of the whole whole. And the, the whole anatomy, what was not possible from microscope. So you know, here's what we used, uh, so some of those endoscopic uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, aided surgeries here. Uh, this is a 50 year old gentleman with, with sort of visual disturbance, he has pituitary hormone dysfunction. So sort of a very common case in the neurosurgery that you will see, uh, you know, and this is a cellar tumor, uh, clivus is here, this is a cellar area. Uh, most likely this is, you know, cranial pharyngioma. It's exam, he has a bitemporal hemianopsia. Uh, this very common pathology, uh, ideal for, for, for an endonasal endoscopic route uh, to, to attack it. And this is a sort of a, I hope a short video. We're going through the nose, the nostrils. I've sped this up quite a bit. Uh, and, and, you know, this is now you're going through the nose straight. You can, this, you are the, you know, seeing the front face of the sphenoid here uh, with the mucosa on either side being cleared a little bit over here, but mucosa is still on the side. And, and, uh, and soon you will see, you can remove the front face of, yeah, front of the sphenoid and you're entering the sphenoid sinus, which is here and, and the, you, the tumor is right in front of you. And, and without being any big incisions, now you're in the, you see the tumor, you clear up some of the dirt, the, the, the mucosa around here and you open up the dirt and you're now interdural through the nose with the endoscope and you move the tumor. And obviously in this case, a CSF leak is a, it's a, it's a dreaded uh, side effect or, or you know, and, and you put, we have to be very careful uh, trying to repair the sort of the skull defect that you get uh, with this. And we, we, use, we use some allografts and then we use a major septic flap to sort of uh, repair the defect. And if you now move your endoscope and move cordially down, what you see is the oropharynx here. And, and these are the, you know, the adenoids, and this is the clivus, the, the area, the clivus, the, the cranial cervical junction over here. So you can see there's just a, the angle, the endoscope is angled very poorly, and you can get to the cranial cervical junction. Yeah. Uh, so it's so a great, great way to get to, get to these, these areas.
Harish, how, how low do you think you can get with an endoscope? Let's say that you had a big, uh, you know, retro, uh, retroflexodontoid, it was fixed and you, you couldn't do cranial cervical reduction from, for ventral brainstem compression. How low could you actually get with the endoscope through a, a, a endoscopic transnasal route? A transnasal route, uh, how low can you go depends upon how the hard palate is in that person. Uh, now, if you cannot go to the transnasal, you can always come down, go to the transoral route, you will get to you will get to the C1, C2 odontoid area uh, through the transoral route. So the hard palate can sometimes decide uh, which route you take. So this is uh, th that case that I just showed before, you know, the big tumor to a totally a transnasal, uh, endonasal endoscopic route, uh, you know, you resect these tumors um, and, and without an incision. And this is a different, a different case, a 70 year old male with a, with a, with a recurrent chordoma you know, the whole clivus is, uh, is infiltrated, uh, is eaten up. Uh, and again, this is ideal case, again, for going through the, through the nose, uh, you know, same approach, uh, through the nose, you reach the clivus, uh, everything endoscopically, and, and uh, you know, you can resect the tumor. Uh, this is some, you know, fat, fat and some of the allograft that was left there to repair, repair a leak that we had uh, for this case. Um, but, you know, these these can also be attacked posteriorly with a posterolateral route, um, but this you know given given how easy access it is through the nose, um, we chose this to do through an endonasal route. And so moving on, you know, this is this is sort of a, might interest some of the spine colleagues here. Uh, this is a uh, male in his sixties. You know, he's he's a, he's a sort of a you know an interesting history. He comes with uh, with a fixed rotatory uh, sort of an, an extensive kind of posture. What happened a few sort of almost a year ago? Uh, he was he was playing and, and whatnot with his grandkids. He he turned and you know he he had a sprain. His neck hurt a lot, and and he thought it was just a neck sprain, and you know didn't do much about it. Uh, thought it'll get better, and and it did sort of you know a, a couple of weeks down his pain got better, uh, but. He, he never regained, regained the posture. He got locked into that posture somehow. He was uh, treated with Botox and physical therapy, you know, sort of, but, but uh, never got any imaging for this. You know, everything was thought some kind of a torticollis or some kind of a, you know, muscle sprain, spasm, whatever. And, and to the point that now, you know, after a few couple months, few months down, he's having, having problem eating. I mean, to the point he, he aspirates, he had a couple of times he aspirated, and finally, he, he had a G tube placed because he was aspirating. He was locked in this position, and uh, and he got a G tube placed, and that's how the way of his nutrition was. And some, you know, after a couple of bouts of pneumonia, somehow decided somehow gets a gets a scan, a CT scan, and and this is what it looks like over here. Uh, and and you know, we don't know what what the, what the initial event was, but this is what what we see. That is, odontoid has somehow fixed with the condyle, has fused with the condyle, uh, and and you know in other cuts you, you will see that this condyle has also fused with with the C1 uh, uh, sort of you know as well, and and again the C1 C2 here is fused as well. So he is somehow fractured. He had initial fracture ligamentous disruption uh, that then you know his pain got better, but he got fused. He fused himself. In, in that sort of awkward position here, you know, in sort of a 3D, 3D reconstruction of this, uh, you know, what it sort of looks like as he has sort of somehow fused with the odontoid with this, with this condyle over here. Sorry, finish that, yeah. So, you know, in this case, the, uh, there is a huge amount of uh, sort of biomechanical, uh, you know, importance over here, I will not go into it. But from a surgery perspective, what we decided was this, this you know, we needed to uh, sort of disrupt this sort of fusion map that, that was happening here and somehow make this mobile, mobile so we can tilt his head, you know, straight. And, and obviously that comes with, uh, comes with uh, you know, cervical junction instability, biomechanical instability that obviously we'll need, he'll need hardware for. Uh, so, and, and to do, to sort of, you know, disrupt this fusion, uh, to resect this, uh, osteotomize this, uh, we chose sort of to go to the anterior transoral route uh, because that you know it was an easier approach uh, getting to that get, getting to this area, the cranio-vertebral junction C1 C2 junction. And again, I just you know bring up again 
Uh, hey, Har Harish, can, can I just interrupt you for two seconds? I think sure. we're, we're, we're approaching the end of the hour. You, would you mind this is up just for a moment? Just to yeah, like this is the last. This is the last case. Awesome. Maybe Thank you. Five more minutes. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, and so this is what we did. The same same slide I showed you before. You, know, you had soft palate. We tracked the soft palate up with our ENT colleagues. Uh, made an incision uh, through the midline over here. It reflected the the mucosa. Um, and uh, you see the cli was a C1C2. We concentrate on C1C2 over here on the condyles. Uh, and uh, again, just you know, just to see what what you will see once you uh, sort of open the mucosa. The C1 arch is gone here. You will see then in the dense, and then you see the the ligaments and normal anatomy, the condyle. And and I don't have video here, but I can show you what the final product looked like over here. Is that this is the pre op over here? We went to the transporter route. And, and resected this, this sort of this dense over here, disrupted this dense condyle fusion here. And, and also there was, there was, you know, sort of a fusion mass over here with this, that disrupted and dislocated this, this sort of, you know, C1, C, a condyle C1 fusion, uh, C and C1, C2 fusion here. And to tilt him uh, sort of in a normal position, obviously some hardware uh, to sort of, you know, uh, take care of the biomechanical instability that we would cause. Uh, I think I'll, I'll I'll sort of stop here. Uh, and and he did he did actually fantastic um, after this this surgery. Uh, yeah, I'll stop. Awesome. Here. Thank you. Harish, thank thank you. That was a, a real tour de force for some skull based approaches. Definitely gave some of our orthopedic colleagues uh, a little bit more of a neurosurgical flavor than we're used to. So um, that was awesome. I think Alex, you're up next week. So what do you have in store for us? Yeah, next week it's from UK, from England. It's uh, Dr. Rotenflo from Oxford and um, a very nice colleague from Singapore, Dr. So, and both are presenting a complex spine from UK and Singapore to make it globally. Thank you very much, Dr. Babu. It's impressive. Thank you. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, guys. See you next week. Take care, guys.